You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. What does Sputnik have to do with student loans? How did a set of trembling hands end the Soviet Union? How did inflation kill moon bases? And how did a former president decide to run for a second non-consecutive term? These are among the topics we deal with on the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics podcast. We tell stories of history that relate to today's news events. Give a listen. My History Can Beat Up Your Politics wherever you get podcasts. As we kick off another major story arc, we thought it might be a good time to engage in a bit of shameless self-promotion. There might be some of you who are just starting to listen here as we start in on the Chattanooga story arc. So we want to let you know there are several ways for you to help support the podcast, if you feel so moved. But there's our T Public storefront where you can purchase t-shirts and other stuff. Or you can make a one-time donation through the website. Or you can support us on a monthly basis over at Patreon by signing up for the Strawfoot Brigade. There's a link on the podcast website that will take you to our T Public storefront. And hey, with it being summertime and people being out and about, what better way to show you're a fan of the show than with an official podcast t-shirt? Then those one-time donations are always appreciated, and you can make a secure donation by going to the podcast website and following the prompts to do that through PayPal. And no, you don't actually need to have a PayPal account to make a donation, since we've had some of you ask about that. And that brings us to the Strawfoot Brigade. And that's just the fun name we came up with for the folks who support the podcast on a monthly basis over on Patreon. Your financial support helps us out, and you get access to tons of members' episodes. In fact, we just recently released members episode number 143. Anyway, you can find information about joining the Strawfoot Brigade if, yes, you guessed it, if you go to the podcast website and click at the top of the main page where it says Patreon slash Strawfoot Brigade. Also at the website, you can find info about us and photos of us if you're curious what we look like, and an email address if you'd like to contact us. So, what is the podcast website? Well, it's www.civilwarpodcast.org. And last but not least, you can help us out by word of mouth, which we hear is still the best advertising. So if you enjoy the podcast, please tell others about it. But if you don't like it, just keep that to yourself. Rich. (laughs) Headquarters, Army of Tennessee, Field of Chickamauga, September 22nd, 1863. It has pleased Almighty God to reward the valor and endurance of our troops, by giving to our arms a complete victory over the enemy's superior numbers. Honor is due and is rendered unto him who giveth not the battle to the strong. Soldiers, after two days of severe battle preceded by heavy and important outpost affairs, you have stormed the barricades and breastworks of the enemy and driven before you in confusion and disorder an army largely superior in numbers and whose constant theme was your demoralization, and whose constant boast was your defeat. Your patient endurance under privations, and your fortitude, and your valor, displayed at all times and under all trials, have been properly rewarded. Your commander acknowledges his obligations and promises to you in advance the country's gratitude. But your task is not ended. We must drop a soldier's tear upon the graves of noble men who have fallen by our sides and move forward. Much has been accomplished. More remains to be done before we can enjoy the blessings of peace and freedom. General Braxton Bragg, Commander, Army of Tennessee. (laughs) 
everyone. Welcome to episode 419 of our Civil War podcast. My name is Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello, y'all. Thanks for tuning into the podcast. The Battle of Chickamauga, fought over September 18th, 19th, and 20th, 1863, was the largest and bloodiest battle in the Civil War's Western Theater. Casualties at Chickamauga had been appalling. The Confederates suffered dreadfully for their hard-fought victory. Missing reports and contradictory estimates make it impossible to offer up with certainty any figure for the rebels, but they lost around 2,300 men killed, 14,670 wounded, and 1,460 missing, for a total of around 18,430. Braxton Bragg himself said he lost two-fifths of his force, which had numbered about 68,000 men. Such losses were clearly staggering, and for the Confederacy, at that late date in the war, were irreplaceable. The butcher's bill for the Federals was almost equally dreadful. The Army of the Cumberland lost 1,656 men killed, 9,749 wounded, and 4,774 missing, for a total of 16,179 casualties, or about 28% of the 57,800 Union soldiers who had entered the battle. Chickamauga was the only clear-cut battlefield victory ever won by the Confederates' Army of Tennessee. Though these same rebels achieved fleeting tactical success on the first day at Shiloh, at Perryville, and at Stones River, each of those battles would be recorded as defeats, since the Confederates withdrew from the field each time. The smaller engagement at Richmond, Kentucky, was a triumph, but only a small part of the army was engaged there, and so it doesn't compare to Chickamauga in terms of importance, size, ferocity, or sacrifice. But by any measure, Chickamauga was a Confederate victory. The Yankees fled the battlefield. Roughly a third of the Army of the Cumberland was routed so completely it couldn't rally and reform until the next day. Yet the Confederates' victory came at a dreadful cost, and perhaps the most important aspect was that when the battle ended, the Federals still held the town of Chattanooga, which was the important strategic objective of the campaign. Nevertheless, as first light filtered through the trees along Chickamauga Creek on the morning of September 21st, by all appearances, Braxton Bragg's Army of Tennessee had won a glorious victory, and the prize of Chattanooga seemed within their grasp. However, as we'll see in this story arc, While the Confederate commander had intended for the battle to be a pivotal turning point, unfortunately for Bragg and the Confederates, in the days and weeks following Chickamauga, history would stubbornly refuse to turn. Braxton Bragg has been almost universally condemned, both by his contemporaries and by posterity, for failing to follow up the indisputable success of Chickamauga with a vigorous pursuit. For that very reason, Confederate Major General D.H. Hill, who certainly bore Bragg a great deal of ill will after the war, called Chickamauga a, quote, barren victory. However, in real time, as the sun rose on September 21st, to the rebel generals on the scene, the circumstances confronting both armies were much less clear than they would be in hindsight. That's right, because, as odd as it sounds today, few Confederates even realized that the Yankees had fled the battlefield. As you guys will recall, it was full dark the previous evening by the time the day's combat ended in both the Kelly Field and Horseshoe Ridge sectors, and the final stages of the battle had been confusing for both sides. As a result, most Confederates simply slumped to the ground where they stood, 
exhausted once the shooting stopped. Almost to a man, the Confederates expected the contest to be renewed in the morning. Most of them believed that the Federals had only fallen back a short distance and that fresh fighting would break out at first light. A staff officer at Bragg's headquarters wrote, quote, About dark, the enemy was routed. We expect him to rally, though, and the fight to be continued tomorrow. The Battle of Chickamauga had begun and ended in confusion, and much of what came between was equally muddled. On the evening of the 20th, as the shooting had sputtered out at Kelly Field and in the darkening woods atop Horseshoe Ridge, the fierce fighting left more confusion behind it. In fact, when left-wing commander James Longstreet was summoned for a pre-dawn conference at Bragg's headquarters, he declined to attend because he fully expected the combat to be renewed at any moment. But as the sky lightened and as the minutes ticked by without anything happening, the rebel skirmishers were pushed forward, and beyond them, Confederate cavalry rode out to locate the new enemy lines. Much of the morning was consumed in these endeavors. According to right-wing commander Leonidas Polk, it was around 9 a.m. before the Confederates fully understood the Yankees had left the vicinity. While waiting for news, Polk wrote a letter to his wife. Then, in in a telling passage, he told her, quote, We have just heard that Rosecrans has retreated to Chattanooga. When Leonidas Polk informed his wife that he had just heard that the Federals had retreated to Chattanooga, that news stemmed from a report just received from one of the Confederate cavalry commanders, Nathan Bedford Forrest, who was out that morning searching for the Yankees. Around 7.30 that morning, Forrest reached the summit of Missionary Ridge, just south of the Rossville Gap. From that spot, he had a splendid view of the surrounding countryside, up to and including the town of Chattanooga. After surveying the scene, Forrest hurriedly penned a message for Polk to be forwarded to Bragg. In that note, Forrest reported he could see the enemy's wagons leaving Chattanooga, and he finished by saying, I think we ought to press forward as rapidly as possible. Forrest's message gave the impression the Federal Army was abandoning Chattanooga and in full retreat. It was argued by many Confederates after the fact that Forrest's dispatch should have galvanized Bragg into immediate action. That it did not, in fact, galvanize Bragg into launching an immediate and vigorous pursuit has been used as a club with which to beat Braxton Bragg for his supposed incompetence and unfitness to command. But actually, Nathan Bedford Forrest was wrong. While he did see wagons leaving Chattanooga, they were loaded with the Federal wounded who were being evacuated to the west, to Bridgeport, Alabama. Not only did he get that wrong, but for some reason, Forrest also failed to mention a word about the fact almost the entire Union Army was reforming around Rossville, which was something that should have been easily observable from his vantage point. Even though Forrest could see, in his own words, quote-unquote, everything around, he somehow overlooked the fact that, far from retreating, most of the Federal Army was reforming at Rossville. At least eight Federal divisions blocked the Rossville Gap or were spread out across the Chattanooga Valley to the west. How could Forrest not have seen them? If he did see them, why didn't he report it? Certainly, this was critical information that Braxton Bragg needed badly. In the immediate aftermath of Chickamauga, any Confederates advancing on Chattanooga would have to fight their way through the Federals digging in at Rossville Gap. To prove this point, when Forrest's cavalry attempted to push through the gap later that same morning, they quickly discovered the Yankees held it in force and the rebel horsemen were easily repulsed. When Bragg's headquarters staff realized the extent of Forrest's negligence, their disgust with him was palpable. 
Captain Taylor Beatty recorded in his diary, quote, Forrest reports that the enemy have burned Chattanooga and fled. The truth turns out that he has never been within three miles of the place, and the enemy are still there, having only burned a few houses which were in the way of him placing their guns. And so, despite the later insistence by some Confederates, such as D.H. Hill, who declared that, quote, a pell-mell advance straight into Chattanooga, end quote, would have captured the place easily, the reality was that in the immediate aftermath of the battle, although Bragg certainly could have organized a more vigorous pursuit, it's almost impossible to see how the Confederates could have easily pushed through the strong federal position at Rossville Gap and captured Chattanooga. If an immediate pursuit of the Federals would have little chance of capturing Chattanooga, it fell to James Longstreet to propose another possible course of action. Right. Braxton Bragg visited Longstreet sometime after 7 a.m., well before any of Forrest reports reached Army headquarters. Bragg wanted to get Longstreet's views on what ought to be done now that the battle was won. At this meeting, Longstreet didn't recommend a rush directly to Chattanooga. Instead, Old Pete argued that the Army should march north and cross the Tennessee River somewhere between Chattanooga and Knoxville. From there, Bragg could either move against Burnside's Federals at Knoxville or could turn west and advance into Middle Tennessee so as to sever Rosecrans' lines of supply and communication. Longstreet's proposal was really more of a briefly sketched outline than a detailed operational plan. As such, the details varied when this meeting was described over the years. However, in all the later instances where Longstreet described his idea, the basic theme was the same. That is, Bragg ought to outflank Rosecrans and transfer the war northward into Tennessee. Old Rosie would then be forced to abandon Chattanooga or retreat in order to protect his supply supply base at Nashville, allowing the rebels to fall upon the Federal Army at a time and place of their own choosing. This idea sounds grand. After all, it's the sort of bold turning movement that Napoleon himself would have favored. But actually, Longstreet's proposal quickly foundered on the unforgiving rocks of reality. As Braxton Bragg was well aware, the simple truth was that the Army of Tennessee was crippled by its own inadequate logistics and would be utterly incapable of pulling off any such maneuver like the one proposed by Longstreet. Even before Chickamauga, when the army was about half its present size, Bragg's command lacked sufficient wagons and draft animals to pull the wagons to even keep itself supplied in the summer of 1863. Now the army's numbers were roughly doubled, but most of the reinforcements from Virginia East Tennessee and Mississippi had arrived by rail and so hadn't brought their own wagons with them. That meant Bragg's already overburdened logistical system was near the point of collapse, just trying to supply his army from the railhead at Catoosta Station, a mere 12 miles away. And so the idea that the army could rapidly shift its area of operations a hundred or more miles north back into Middle Tennessee was simply absurd. Even bringing up sufficient pontoons to bridge the Tennessee River would prove nearly impossible. You see, Bragg had ordered his pontoons out of Chattanooga in early September when he abandoned the place to the Federals, and now those mobile bridges were sitting in Cartersville, Georgia, some 60 miles to the south. All of that's to say that bold, dramatic movements like the one Longstreet proposed may have sounded good and looked possible on a map, but were, in fact, beyond Bragg's immediate power to execute. Of course, James Longstreet probably knew very little of the details of Bragg's supply situation. Old Pete, coming down from Virginia, had only arrived on the scene two days earlier, 
and he had immediately plunged into the storm of battle. Bragg certainly should have enlightened Longstreet as to the reality of the army's precarious logistics, but he doesn't appear to have done that. After hearing Longstreet out, Bragg departed, leaving old Pete with the impression he agreed with his ideas and would carry them out. Longstreet would be shocked and disappointed when that didn't happen. Hey y'all, spooky season is here. And if you're looking for a show to whet your appetite for a little haunted history, then I'd like to invite you to check out Southern Gothic, a chart-topping history podcast that explores some of the most infamous legends, folklore, ghost stories, and hauntings of the American South. We've covered all sorts of stuff from the Bell Witch of Tennessee to the disappearance of the Confederate submarine, the H.L. Hunley. Not to mention our deep dives into the local lore of some of America's oldest and most haunted cities like New Orleans, Charleston, and St. Augustine. So if you're ready for a little good old-fashioned Halloween storytelling with a commitment to quality historical research, then be sure to check out Southern Gothic today. It's available now on all your favorite podcast apps. What's something you learned in history class that you feel wasn't the whole truth. Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. I believe that all history, no matter how good or bad, needs to be told. There are wars, massacres, battles, and entire historical events that are just not in our school's history books. Have you ever heard of Mary Bowser? I didn't think so. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. So come huddle around the campfire with me and get ready to hear the stories that you were robbed of. And get comfortable. We're going to be here a while. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. If an immediate vigorous pursuit of the Yankees was unlikely to achieve the desired result of capturing Chattanooga, and if a bold, dramatic turning movement was out of the question due to the Army's shaky supply situation, then the final option available to Braxton Bragg would be to move the Army of Tennessee slowly and cautiously forward, putting pressure on the federal defenses, and seal off Chattanooga's southern approaches in hopes of laying siege to the town. Even then, though, actually laying siege to Chattanooga, in the traditional sense, would be out of the question, since Bragg had no way of sending enough troops to the north bank of the Tennessee River to completely sever Rosecrans' supply line. Given the realities of his logistical situation, Bragg's only practical choice in the aftermath of Chickamauga was to opt for a limited siege of Chattanooga. That decision was destined to disappoint nearly everyone on the Confederate side, despite the fact that it was the only realistic course of action open to the Army of Tennessee. Most Confederates would blame Braxton Bragg for failing to capitalize on the victory at Chickamauga and for turning that success into a quote-unquote barren victory. He would be severely criticized in print during and especially after the war. As much as we hate to come to Braxton Bragg's defense, in fairness it must be pointed out that much of this criticism was based on a faulty understanding of or an ignoring of, the realities of the situation. The Federal Army wasn't completely routed, despite many rebel claims to the contrary. Additionally, the Army of Tennessee's logistical situation ruled out any bold turning movement like the one proposed by James Longstreet. As a result, Bragg's options shrank dramatically when confronted by those realities, (laughs) 
leaving a limited siege of Chattanooga as the only realistic course of action open to him. If Braxton Bragg faced difficult choices right after the battle, so did William Rosecrans. The Federals had only narrowly escaped complete disaster at Chickamauga, but when the sun rose on September 21st, the Army of the Cumberland was in surprisingly good shape, all things considered. Most of its formations were intact, if still suffering from a great deal of straggling. But the 21st was a day of recovery for the Federals. It helped that, in Missionary Ridge, they had an imposing defensive position. George Thomas draped his depleted formations along the crest of Missionary Ridge at Rossville Gap and across Chattanooga Valley toward Lookout Mountain. In the immediate aftermath of the battle, the Confederates would be hard-pressed to simply smash through Rossville Gap by sheer force. George Thomas was prepared for any renewal of the fighting on the 21st, but the Confederates chose not to seriously test his defenses that day. Rosecrans sent ammunition and rations from Chattanooga, and the men filled their canteens with clear, cold water from the many mountain springs. Soldiers who had become separated from their units gradually reported for duty and reunited with friends and comrades who had given them up for dead. Best of all, from the standpoint of morale, men who had lost hope because of the exhausting campaign and the traumatic events of the previous several days now began to recover their optimism. True, they had suffered a near disaster at Chickamauga, but they still held Chattanooga, which was the strategic prize both armies were vying for. For his part, William Rosecrans was well aware the powers that be in Washington expected him to hold on to Chattanooga in spite of his defeat at Chickamauga. However, in the immediate aftermath of the battle, Rosecrans' confidence in his ability to hold the town shifted back and forth from hopefulness to gloom, sometimes from hour to hour. Contrary to Rosecrans' later assertions, when he reached Chattanooga on the 20th, he was physically and mentally exhausted. His hyperactive personality meant that he rarely slept much on campaign. Major General David Stanley, who served with Rosecrans in 1862 and 63, observed, quote, He never slept. He overworked himself. He smoked incessantly. At Iuka, Corinth, and at Stones River, the stress and excitement did not exceed a week. His strong constitution could stand that. But at Chickamauga, this strain lasted a month, and Rosecrans' health was badly broken. This tracks with the report of Rosecrans' chief of staff, Brigadier General James Garfield, that on the 20th, after they rode away from the battle and reached Rossville, Rosecrans, quote, assented listlessly and mechanically, end quote, when Garfield suggested he return to the battlefield while Rosecrans go to Chattanooga. When Rosecrans reached Chattanooga, he was so exhausted he couldn't even dismount from his horse under his own power. Even staff officer and loyal Rosecrans supporter Captain Henry Sist admitted that the commanding general, quote, had to be helped from his horse into the house, end quote, and that, quote, he had the appearance of one broken in spirit. In far off Washington, the state of affairs at Chattanooga appeared to be grim. Abraham Lincoln, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, and General in Chief Henry Halleck read and reread every telegram that came in. One of the first messages to reach the War Department telegraph office at about 4 p.m. on the afternoon of the 20th was from Assistant Secretary of War Charles Dana, who had just fled the battlefield, and as soon as he reached Chattanooga, sent a message that painted a picture of absolute disaster. Dana was a newspaper man, not a trained soldier, 
and his first dispatch verged on panic. Four hours later, he sent a second wire, in which he was more upbeat, reflecting the news that George Thomas had managed to make a defensive stand on the battlefield. But by the time that message reached Washington, the damage had been done, especially since, an hour after Dana's first telegram, a shake in William Rosecrans had also sent a report saying that the army had, quote, met with a serious disaster, extent not yet ascertained, enemy overwhelmed us. Abraham Lincoln realized the need to buck up Rosecrans and made it a point to send encouraging words, assuring the obviously rattled general, quote, We have unabated confidence in you and in your soldiers and officers. But in private, Lincoln would confide to his secretary, John Hay, that Rosecrans seemed stunned in the aftermath of the battle, like, quote, a duck hit on the head. Although it was obvious Rosecrans was demoralized and exhausted when he reached Chattanooga and would continue to struggle in the days ahead, his choices militarily were limited. Right, and actually it came down to two options. He could hold Chattanooga and hope to be reinforced, or he could retreat to Bridgeport. Rosecrans' first option was to simply dig in at Chattanooga and hang on. However, trying to hold the town would be extremely difficult. Rosecrans lacked sufficient troops to control all of the surrounding terrain, especially Lookout Mountain. And without the high ground, Rosecrans would be trapped in Chattanooga. There was the very real possibility that after the Confederates seized the heights overlooking the town, they could simply starve the Yankees out. If Bragg had enough troops, He might even force the Federals trapped in Chattanooga to surrender, which would be a disaster of the first degree. Rosecrans' second option was an immediate withdrawal from Chattanooga, which would mean all the campaign's marching, fighting, and dying would have been for naught. Rosecrans certainly must have known a retreat and giving up Chattanooga would be hard to sell to the powers that be in Washington, and that he would be unlikely to retain command. Retreat was really only an option because it was better than losing the whole army, but it certainly wasn't an attractive option. And in the end, Old Rosie decided to try to hold on to Chattanooga. But his mood still fluctuated alarmingly. On the 21st, he wired Washington, saying, We have no certainty of holding our position here. The next day, Charles Dana sent a message warning, Rosecrans is considering the question of retreat unless he can have assurance of ample reinforcements within one week. Then, on the 27th, Dana sent a lengthy message to Stanton, severely criticizing Rosecrans, saying, quote, He is greatly lacking in firmness and steadiness of will. Once he made the decision to hold Chattanooga, Rosecrans ordered George Thomas to pull back from Rossville Gap into the valley that held the town. No military man ever wants to give up the high ground, but the Federals simply didn't have enough troops to adequately defend the mountainous terrain that looked down on Chattanooga. And so, after the sun set on the evening of the 21st, the Yankees once again slipped away in the dead of night. By dawn on the 22nd, the Army of the Cumberland occupied a tight line running in a semicircle around Chattanooga and was working to greatly expand the defenses originally set up by the Confederates when they occupied the town. Atop Lookout Mountain, a Union cavalryman described the scene revealed in the morning light. Chattanooga, he wrote, was, quote, encircled by yellow lines of earthworks, which extended unbrokenly from the mountains to the river. An inner circle of dark blue was still more apparent, from which the bayonets and the colors gleamed in the sunlight. 
Within two days' time, Lookout Mountain would also be lost to the Confederates when Rosecrans ordered the Brigade of Federals manning those important heights to pull back after nightfall on the 23rd and join the rest of the army in the defensive works protecting Chattanooga. The withdrawal of those Federal soldiers from Lookout Mountain represented the final step of the Army of the Cumberland's retreat from Chickamauga. Now, it was clear that if Braxton Bragg wanted to complete his success over the Yankees, a new campaign would be needed to actually capture Chattanooga. And, as we'll see, in this new campaign, the critical issue would be supplies. Because even as the Federals dug in, creating a semicircle of earthworks around Chattanooga from one bank of the Tennessee River to the other, the Confederates moved up and occupied the high ground which the Yankees had just given up. And by doing that, and especially by holding Lookout Mountain and controlling the valley beyond, the rebels would make it exceedingly difficult for Rosecrans to get supplies into Chattanooga. And so, yes, in this new campaign, logistics would be the critical issue. In fact, even as his men busied themselves digging in, William Rosecrans reported to Washington that the army had only 10 days' worth of rations on hand. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation. And our recommendation this time is a re-recommendation of Six Armies in Tennessee, the Chickamauga and Chattanooga Campaigns by Stephen E. Woodworth. With Six Armies in Tennessee, Woodworth does an excellent job of creating an easily readable but impressively comprehensive account of these two campaigns. If you want to explore what happened at Chickamauga and Chattanooga some more on your own, but don't want to get bogged down in details, then we really can't recommend Six Armies in Tennessee enough. Don't forget you can find a list of all of our book recommendations if you head over to the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. As the curtain comes down on this episode, we want to take a minute to thank the newest members of the Strawfoot Brigade. So a big thank you to Peter D., Larry F., Uplifted3216, Blake C., and MJ. And thanks to David W. for his donation. And thanks to all of you for listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861-1865, to 1865, a history podcast. Rich and I do hope that you join us again next time. But until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.